Okay, so should I just start? No, no, let me first introduce <laughs> introduce <laughs> what we're <laughs> Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's uh, uh, Biological Physics, Physical Biology Seminar. So we have got two very exciting speakers today, uh, Wallace Marshall from UCSF and then Ajay Gopinathan from UC Merced. Uh, before we start, I wanted to mention a few things about the seminar format. So first is please write your full name on Zoom. You can hover over your photo and rename yourself. And this will help us ask your questions from the chat box. Next is during the talk, please mute yourself and you can type any questions you have for, for the speakers in the chat, chat box. And if there are any clarifying questions, I will ask those immediately. For the remaining questions, we will ask those uh, during the five minute Q&A after the talk. And once both talks are over, we are going to have a 15 minute informal discussion uh, when we will take more questions. You can also unmute yourselves and ask questions at that time directly. And also both talks are going to be recorded today. Okay, without further ado, uh, Wallace, please take it away. All right. And let me stop sharing. Okay. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see our slides. Okay, great. So I'm gonna tell you about our attempts to learn something about organelle size control by looking at fluctuations in the size of an organelle. So um, um, if you look at cells, that we think of them sometimes as being amorphic, amorphous bags of enzymes, but actually they have very complex and beautiful structures. And so and the question is, you know, where does all the structure come from? And at some level, we can break the structure down into the, into the size and shape of individual subcellular structures. Uh, we think that a really good structure to uh, ask these kind of questions is the flagellum because it's a linear um, structure. So it's easy to uh, visualize and measure. We are studying fl uh, flagella using Clemenomonas, which is a, a unicellular green alga. We use Clemenomonas because it's very much like yeast. It has a lot of the genetic tractability as yeast, but it has flagella, which yeast doesn't have. So when we talk about cilia and flagella in, in this context, we mean eukaryotic flagella, not prokaryotic flagella. So those of you who might be studying bacterial flagella, they're really quite different structures. They share no molecular similarity whatsoever. How the bacterial flagella controls its length is also a very interesting question, but it's not what we're looking at here. So um, the question you might ask is, well, does the cell even care how long its flagella are? So Clemenomonas is a swimming cell. It tries to swim towards light in order to, to photosynthesize. And it swims using its two flagella and essentially a breaststroke motion. So it, it goes like this through the water. And what we've done here is to measure how fast, well, we've actually measured how far the cell can get in a fixed period of time as a function of how long its two flagella are. And so that's color coded here. So we have L1 and L2 are the lengths of the two flagella. And then red means it makes really good progress. Blue means not so much progress. And what we see is that in order to get a, to swim a long distance, you need to be about the 10 to 12 micron length range. And you need to have the two flagella approximately equal in length. And that makes sense. If they're two unequal, the cell will swim in a curved path, which we can actually see. So there's a biological, um, you know, a fitness benefit to having your flagella length be in the right range and also be equal to each other. So we think the cell actually does care about um, how long its flagella are. So it's not just an academic exercise to understand what controls the size. I'm in so much trouble advancing my cell. Okay, so um, what are the different ways we could try to explore the mechanisms for controlling the size of flagella? So we and others have used um, genetics for many years. So there's a lot of mutants around that affect the length. In most cases, those haven't told us what the mechanism is, but they at least show us some of the components. We've done a lot of, we and others again, have done a lot of live cell imaging of flagella assembling and wa watching their steady state behavior, watching transport of molecules within flagella. So we've learned a lot. And as a result, there's a, a, a sort of a growing proliferation of models. You know, we've made a several models in, in our group. Others have made several other models. All these models are actually doing a pretty good job of explaining the steady state behavior of length. That is, they can all account for how the average length is set to what it is. Um, and in a population, how the, cell, how the flagella will all grow out to a particular length, for example. So the question now is, well, how else can we learn more information that we can try to use to distinguish between some of those models? And so the approach we're taking, one of the approaches we're taking is to basically draw a page from other, from other areas of physics where once you can you know, explain the steady state behavior, now you look about fluctuations around that steady state and it's a new way to gain information about what's going on. So 
for, for Clemenomonas, the cell has two um, equivalent flagella. They're biochemically almost identical. And so it, it struck us, this is actually very similar to the way people measure fluctuations in gene expression, where what you do is you take a cell and you put the, the same, you know, you, you put two different reporters, two different fluorescent molecules under control of the same uh, promoter, and then you can um, ask about correlated versus uncorrelated fluctuation in the expression of those genes. So we can do the exact same thing with flagella because we can measure both flagella in a cell, and we can therefore ask about correlated variation of the two flagella from cell to cell, and then we can also ask about the uncorrelated variation of flagella within one cell, so one is one longer than the other. And we can actually use the same mathematical formalisms that are used for gene expression, so we can um, define so-called extrinsic and intrinsic noise, and this, what you basically do is you, you take the, the correlated variation from cell to cell, you call that the extrinsic noise because it's extrinsic to the thing you're measuring, which in our case is the flagellum, in their case is, is genes. And then whatever's left is the uncorrelated variation. They call that the intrinsic noise, implying that there's a source inside the thing you're studying. Now, I'll be honest, there's a lot of assumptions that go into these, um, um, into these descriptions. So for now, I prefer to treat these as operational descriptions. They're just ways to, to uh, um, summarize the numbers that you get. They're making a statement about where the noise sources are, which may or may not um, actually be true in, in, in any given physical system. So we can start looking at um, the lengths of the individual flagella. So what we see is that if, if we take a, a number of measurements of, of lengths within individual cells, we see that, um, so this is comparing just the, the lengths of the two flagella with each other, we find that in, in most cases, the flagella lengths are typically near the diagonal, meaning that they're close to each other in length. They tend to be concentrated in this range of 10 to 12 microns, which is where the best swimming occurs. But they're certainly scattered. So you see scatter along the diagonal, meaning that there's cell to cell variation in the length of both flagella. And you see scatter perpendicular to the diagonal, which is telling you about inequalities in, in length um, within one cell. And we can then take these numbers and use the same expressions that people use for gene expression, and we can put a number on the intrinsic and extrinsic variation. So um, one thing that comes out right away, for example, is that gametes, which are a kind of cell specialized for mating where, the two, where basically two cells come together and touch by the tips of their flagella, and that only works if the flagella are equal in length. And we see in gametes, we see a, a decreased intrinsic variation, meaning that the cells tend to be, have flagella that are more equal in length as, as you, they would require for their function. So what I showed you before is just um, looking at fixed cells in a population. So it could be the case that different cells are born with different length flagella and that's what they have. And that the variation we see is sort of a population level variation in that, but, but, not but maybe individual cells don't actually show any variation over time. That isn't the case. So a work done by my student Kimberly Wember where she embedded individual cells in agarose and then watched the lengths over time. What you can see here is if you plot the mean squared change in flagella length versus time on a, you know, an individual cells, it looks very much like a traditional random walk, you know, diffusive motion up to a certain length range of around 10 or 12, at which point it starts to become constrained. And so we think what we're seeing is, yes, true fluctuation in the flagella length, but then there's a constraint that kicks in around this um, length range of about 12 microns, which is the length they're going to try to get to. And so one way to think about this, I think, is that this constraint is telling us about the control system. So we talk about is those length being controlled. The way that that control, whatever that is, is manifest is in the fact that you basically end up not um, being able to, to, to fluctuate beyond that, that range. That's one way to think about it. Um, so anyway, we definitely are seeing um, fluctuations that are occurring. So now the question is, what can we learn from that? So one question is, can we really distinguish intrinsic from extrinsic noise? That is, can we tell any, can we really say that there's a noise source inside the flagella as opposed to a noise source out in the cell body? So when we say the system, um, we're referring to the flagellum itself as, as the system, so anything in there is intrinsic. And then the environment in our case would be the cell body plus I guess anything else outside the cell body. Um, and so the usual uh, mathematical way of decomposing these two components that I showed you before used in gene expression makes a lot of assumptions. It assumes, you know, independence of the noise sources within the two, uh, you know, there's two copies of the system that then are communicating with each other. It assumes that all the noise is additive, which there's no reason to think that would be the case in a complex biochemical system. So there's a lot of assumptions in there. And if those are violated, you can't necessarily decompose these sources um, using um, those just in terms of correlated, uncorrelated variation. So are there more direct ways we can look for sources of fluctuation in these two um, um, components? So the first question, okay, is there any noise that's intrinsic to the flagellum itself? Maybe it's all coming from the cell body. Well, how could that be, you say? Because we've already shown that the lengths can be, can be unequal to each other. 
Well, one possibility is that when the flagella first form, there's something different about them. So there's some asymmetry between the two flagella in a cell, which makes them respond differently to, the, to a fluctuation coming from the environment, namely, namely the cell body. And therefore, and then if you had multiplicative noise coming from the cell body, for example, you know, if you had an enzyme process that's making something and the cell body is producing a substrate for that enzyme, you would actually get a multiplicative dependence of the enzyme output on the concentration of that substrate. And so that could then give you a fluctuation in the two flagella if there, if there was some inequality there. So, so this is a concern that we have. So maybe there is no noise in, going on inside the flagellum. So uh, one way we've been trying to get at that is that if we look at the lengths of the two flagella, the kind of mechanism that I showed you before would basically make both flagella get longer or both of them get shorter because of some asymmetry, they would do so to a greater or lesser extent, but they would always tend to, you wouldn't change which one is longer or which one is shorter. And what we see in fact is that um, if we take the difference in, in the lengths of the two flagella within one cell, the sign of that difference changes in, in most of the cells that we look at. And we think that if we look longer, it would probably change in all of them. So we think that the sign changing effect where the, where the flagella take turns being the long one and being the short one, would be very hard to explain with a simple kind of uh, you know, baked in asymmetry model that, that I showed you before. Okay, so then, well, what about, the cell, what about the extrinsic noise? Is there any noise coming from the cell body? It could just all be happening inside the flagella. And so the question is, okay, you know, why do you then see a, a so-called correlated component? Well, it could be the two flagella are communicating to each other. And in fact, we know this is probably true. That is, at the very least, they're both competing for precursor proteins, but maybe they're sending signals. There are actually um, physical protein structures that link the base of the two flagella. Those could be communicating mechanically or acting as tracks to carry a signal. So we don't have any reason to believe that there is no communication between the flagella. And so what could happen is if you have fluctuations in one flagellum and then there's some communication between them, that fluctuation would then drive a fluctuation in the other flagellum, which could lead to a correlated component that mathematically, you know, by our formulas, we would call that extrinsic noise, even though it's actually entirely intrinsic to, to the flagellum, it's to the flagella themselves. So how can we ask about that? So this ended up being, um, a project that's taken years and years and years, and it's um, it was started actually by Juyuan Li. Some of you uh, may may know her; she's just starting a faculty position at Beida, and so she started this as a rotation project. I don't even know when. Let's just say a decade or more ago, working with another student, Will Ludington, um, several other people. So my 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 postdoc here with Chicago has been trying this, and um, only recently have we actually got this to work. So the experiment is the following: we know in Clementomonas that if you pH shock them, so you 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 transiently lower the pH of the media they will shed their flagella and then regrow them over the period of about a couple of hours. So the experiment is to measure the lengths of the flagella in a cell, then pH shock it, let the flagella grow back and ask what is the length after they grow back? And the question would be, do you see a higher correlation of flagella lengths before and after this experiment in a single cell compared to unrelated cells? And that would argue that there's something that was maintained in the cell body that carried over and helped to determine the lengths of those flagella. So the idea is you want to trap the cells in a fluidic device. And the problem was that the devices we were using, which were these commercially developed um, devices um, using a, a chamber invented by Will Ludington, really weren't, were not working for this process. And I think a lot of the problem, part of the problem was the cells kept floating away, but a bigger problem is actually simply doing the transient pH shock in these commercial devices where we had no control over the length of the channels feeding into the device. It was actually not possible to get the pH um, to, to change as rapidly as you needed to. So that's sort of a trivial thing, but it took a long time to actually do this techn technically. And finally, David Bauer, a student in the lab, um, got this to work. So on his device is shown on the left with basically a serpentine channel with holes in the channel wall. So cells get trapped in those holes. And by using a, a relatively high flow rate and very short uh, channel lengths, he could get the pH shock to, uh, to, to happen really effectively. So the results are summarized on the right, um, where we plot the initial length prior to the shock and then the final length after the flagella have regenerated. Now, this is clearly not as beautiful as we'd like. That is, if there was a really strong determining factor in the cell body, we would like to see the numbers sort of sitting on the diagonal, and that's absolutely not what we see. There's statistically you know, a, a, a significant correlation um, between the lengths before and after. Um, we think part, you know, this is actually, the, the correlation coefficient you get is about what you'd expect to get given the magnitude of the intrinsic variation that we already know is happening. So in other words, you're never gonna get perfect uh, agreement because the flagella are al also fluctuating themselves. So the results match what we, what we would expect to see actually in this experiment. And another way to look at it, I'm um, shown below, is to um, make a histogram of the mean squared um, difference in the flagella lengths um, before and after the shock, looking at the same cell versus unrelated cells. And we see a, a much larger difference in unrelated cells. 
So we do believe there's something which is being carried over in the cell body and that would then therefore count as sort of extrinsic noise source. So what can we do now that we have these numbers? You know, um, one way we can use these numbers is as a way to compare different, um, different mutant strains and ask some basic questions. So I think you know, that this combination of genetics and quantitative measurements is very powerful and something that we like to do. For example, so here we're um, looking at the intrinsic noise measurement in a variety of mutant strains. And so one thing that we can say, um, looking on the left, compared to wild type cells, if we poison translation with cyclohexamide, so now basically gene expression is taken out of the picture, we don't see any difference in the intrinsic noise, implying that gene expression, while obviously it's important to make all the components, is not playing an ongoing role in, a, in actively adjusting lengths. So that's good because I personally hate transcription and don't want to have to think about it. So, so that's a big relief. Okay, um, what about the flagella um, themselves and their emotions? So as I showed on, so the left, that, that figure on the left um, for wild type is showing that a, a wild type cell swims with a breaststroke motion, the flagella are very close to each other. So you could imagine all kinds of models whereby hydrodynamic coupling between the two flagella is used to measure and adjust their lengths. We think that's probably not the case as shown um, in the, for, for the mutant PF18 in the middle. This is a mutant where the flagella are completely non motile they stick straight out. And we don't see any increase in the fluctuation in flagella that are not moving. So we don't think that, that any kind of motility is involved in, um, in damping out fluctuation. Likewise, I mentioned earlier that there are physical um, fiber, protein fibers that connect the base of the flagella that could be involved in communication between them. But um, as shown in, in the third um, little cartoon there for the VFL2 mutant, this is a mutant which takes away those connections and so that the flagella are now coming out from different parts of the cell, and we don't see any um, increase in, in the intrinsic variation there either. So we think that, that we can use this kind of uh, measurement to, to, to test various possible um, mechanistic models for, for, for things that could, for components that could be involved in coordinating flagella lengths. So do we actually see anything that affects the variation? And the answer is yes. So there are four different mutants, actually there's five now in Clemenomonas that have average increase in flagella length. So they're called long flagella mutants, LF1, LF2, LF3, LF4. And we know what the proteins are that encode them, but we don't know really uh, mechanistically how they make the flagella get longer. But what we see is that in all cases, when the flagella get longer, there's a big increase in the intrinsic um, variation. So this, this, um, this uh, uncorrelated variation between the two flagella. And here's just an example here. I've plotted on the same kind of scatter plot, two of these mutants, LF1, LF4. And if you recall the earlier image I showed of wild type, this is much, um, much more scatter off the diagonal. We actually see for some of them a little bit uh, more extent of scatter along the diagonal as well. So for LF4, we see an increase in both intrinsic and extrinsic variation. In LF1, most of the increase actually is in the intrinsic noise. And it's not so much what people call these long flagella mutants, implying that the average length is longer. But in many cases, like LF1, the average length is actually not that much longer. It's just that some of the cells are very long because there's more variation. So the question now is, this, I think this is a, a very clear result that any model you could make would have to explain. And there's more and more models coming online now for flagella length control. And I think they're all gonna, this is a very clear test. Can your model explain why longer average length of flagella will lead to um, greater uh, fluctuation? So um, I'm gonna show you just one example of, of, of how we think a, a class of models can potentially um, fit with this measurement. So um, to, just the background to tell you is that the length of the flagella at some point is a result of a balance of assembly and disassembly. So what I've shown here in green is the uh, microtubules that are the main structural element of the flagellum. And we know from direct measurement that tubulin is constantly being added at the tip and also constantly being removed. And it's the balance of those two that determine what, what length you, you are at. And um, again, from direct measurements, what we, what, we, what we know is that the rate of disassembly, the rate of tubulin removal, is independent of length. So plotting rates versus length, this um, disassembly rate gives you a, a flat line. And we also know that the rate of assembly is scaling as one over the length. Now, why, how that happens is a whole other question. It's something that we're studying very actively, we and others. So there's a whole slew of models to account for this one over L dependence. But given that that is what, what we see, we end up with a picture here for length control in which what we're seeing that the, the length that you observe is a steady state solution um, where these two curves intersect, right? So when the assembly rate balances disassembly, now you're at steady state. And we can obviously, you know, obviously mathematize that in simple ways. And the question is, can this explain what we've observed? And the idea is very simple. The idea is that if you're sitting at one of these steady state solutions as shown, at, um, I, I don't think I have a, I don't know how to do a cursor here, but anyway, um, can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Okay, great. So, so if you're sitting at a steady state solution here, where say, uh, sorry, say here, where you have a certain disassembly rate in red and a certain assembly rate in blue, 
imagine that that a cell sitting at that steady state becomes displaced from it because of some fluctuation. So, so now it gets a little bit shorter, say. The, the rate at which it will return to that steady state depends on the slope of the intersection of these two curves, right? So if they're intersecting at a very, a very, um, uh, with a very small slope, it'll take a long time, but effectively the, the restoring force is low. Whereas um, if you had, say, say a, a different cell in which the disassembly rate was much higher so that the average length was shorter, that would actually give you an in increasing slope of intersection and therefore a, a higher effective restoring force. So the idea is that the longer the flagellum is, and what you can see from this graph is that as you get to longer, longer lengths, the slope of intersection is gonna go down and down and down. So if you had a mutation which had very long length, you would end up having a very slow damping out of any fluctuation that you got. So it wouldn't be so much that there was more fluctuation, but whenever a fluctuation occurred for whatever reason, it would just take longer for that to go away. And that would then allow this, um, basically the system to gradually pile up more and more um, you know, displacement away from, from your steady state as the fluctuations keep coming in. So the prediction then would be that, yes, you have increased um, um, intrinsic variation because it takes longer to damp out fluctuations. And so because we have live cell measurement of flagellar lengths, we can actually measure this. And the result is indeed, um, if we plot oral correlations um, of wild type cells versus long flagellar mutants, we find that in all cases, the long flagellar mutants have a longer correlation time, meaning they're taking longer to damp out the fluctuations that they have. So, um, that's what I wanted to tell you about today in terms of our studies of fluctuations. I want to acknowledge the people who have, have done the work here. Most of what I, a lot of, some of what I showed you, I did myself, which is why it's been taking forever. But um, a lot of what I showed you was, um, was the work of David Bauer and Kimberly Wemmer with help from uh, Hiro Ishikawa, Will Ludington. And then um, there's other students now working in the lab on other aspects of length control, which I wish I had more time to talk about. I want to acknowledge our funding sources. I want to acknowledge our tremendous collaborators, um, and we keep having new collaborators, and we couldn't do anything we do without them. And I want to really thank uh, Mo and Sri for inviting me to give this talk, and all of you for listening. And I'll take, I guess, any questions if there's time now or else later after we're done. Thank you, Wallace, for a wonderful talk. I will clap for everybody. So I, there are a lot of questions already in the chat box, and we do have some, quite some time for questions. So I will read out some of the questions and then if we have more time, you know, people can maybe unmute themselves and ask more questions. So I will start with questions by Marco Polin and you had a number of questions, very nice. Uh, so the uh, first question you ask is, how is your observed fluctuation at steady state? Uh, how, does the, how does your observed fluctuation at steady state compare with the typical experimental error in the determination of the flagellar length. Yeah, so let's see if I can figure out how to uh, move up and down. Okay, so, yeah, so, um, so, okay, so, so, yeah, so that's, that's a really good point. Um, so, we try to mount cells in a way where the flagella typically are, are lying within one focal plane, which is, so, so the nice thing there is that the very, uh, um, we can trace lengths then in, in one focal plane pretty reliably. In cases where the flagella have weird conformations, where they're out of the plane, that's that's definitely a concern. Um, the plot here is showing the the um, fluctuation, so the mean square change in length um, on top in, in, in living cells, and then in, in the black dots down very close to the to the axis, those are the um, the results for cells that, that were fixed in methanol. So if, if the cells are dead, so this is a measure of, of our, our our measurement error. So we think we're we're doing really well in in, in this case. But again, it, it really depends on whether we can, get, and the nice thing is, you know, the flagella, they're on the order of 10 microns. So it's a, it's, it's a length scale where we can do, you know, really precise measurements. Um, and the fluctuations are large. So I think, I think the basic answer is our fluctuations are large compared to, to the measurement error. Mm -hmm. At this time scale now, you know, if we wanted to ask more, more subtle things, it would become more of a problem. Okay, and then Christy W has a related question about the, uh, the measurement error. So she's asking by experimental error, do you mean how they measured length accounting for curvature? So her question is related to curvature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so again, so, you know, um, if the flagella curve a lot, especially if they curve up and out of the plane. So, you know, what we do is, is we, we're currently doing this manually. So there's, a, so that's another source of error, but we manually trace the, 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 the flagella in the computer. Um, uh, and so we take the curvature into account, um, certainly by doing that. And as long as they're in X, X, Y plane, we can do that really nicely. Um, I think there's certainly scope for um, automating this. One thing, so here Ishikawa has, has, has automated some of this. Um, and, and so I think we can automate it and make, at least take out any source of, you know, unconscious human bias and so on. 
Um, so yeah, so, so we, we do take into account curvature. Flagella tend to, um, in the wild type range, tend to be relatively straight when you embed them. For the long flagella, they're so long that they do actually curve more, you know, so the curvature, the average curvature is the same, but because their length is longer, you know, the, the, the cumulative um, curve, um, you know, the, the cumulative change in the, in the tangent um, becomes larger. And so then you do have more potential source of error. So one thing that I do, you know, lose a little sleep over is could some of our apparent increase in variation in long flagella mutants simply be because of effects like that, where it's harder to accurately measure the lengths of those long flagella. And then Jay Shao asks, uh, do the flagella grow or shrink in response to the environment? Should that effect be separated from the noise measurement in flagella length measurements? Right, so when we talk about extrinsic noise, you know, technically that would also include the environment. So yes, absolutely. So if you, um, if you change the environment, so if you change, say, the ionic composition of the media, you absolutely get changes in length. And, and this is something that we're actively studying. If you change calcium, for example, you can make flagella um, shorten dramatically. Um, there's also changes with respect to, you know, light intensity, where you are in, in the circadian cycle. So, we, you know, we, we try to control for those things as, as best we can. Um, one interesting source of, of environmental in input would be um, mechanical flow. So, um, so uh, uh, Jay Sarabrenic, who was a, a summer student many years ago, put cells in a fluidic device and then flowed the, the media over them at different flow rates and found that there was one flow rate where the flagella reached the maximum steady state length. And then on either side of that, so faster or slower flow gave you slightly shorter flagella. It was a, a small effect, but it was you know, very clearly there. So what we try to do is you know, put all our cells in an identical environment so, and then compare them all within our cells and, and within that one sample and try to always do it the same way every time. But I'll admit, there's absolutely scope for variation caused by environmental changes that we don't know how to control for. And then Hanuel, you asks, does cell body size correlate with flagellar length? In other Great. words, do cells know what is the optimal length of the flagella for their body size? Yes, that I have a plot of that I did not include. So, so uh, the the graph here on, on, on the left shows you the, the um, length of flagella on individual cells plotted versus the diameter of the cell body. And what we see is that between, um, a, 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 for around four to eight microns um, variation in cell body, you do see an almost linear change in length. It's quite interesting actually to think about what kind of mechanism would give you a, a linear scaling of length with the diameter of the cell. I would have guessed it would scale as the volume of the cell because you know more, bigger cells have more ribosomes in them but whatever reason it's going um, linearly, which I think is informative. And what I really like is the, and so this also is one, another reason for thinking that there is sort of extrinsic uh, variation due to cell to cell variation. But what I find very interesting is that when you get beyond about eight microns cell body size, you no longer see an increase in length as, due to further increase in the cell body. So how do we explain that? I don't know, but a hand waving explanation is that we, um, is, is that anything that's made in the cell body. So the basic model of this kind of thing is that bigger cells make more of everything and that's why you make larger structures. Okay, fine. But um, what we know is that in order to grow the flagellum, as I showed you, all the assembly is occurring at the tip as, this, as the flagellum is growing. And, and um, we know there's an active, there's a kinesin-based active transport called intraflagellar transport that captures um, substrates with a series of docking proteins and carries them out to the tip where they're deposited for assembly. So the idea that we have is that for when the cells are small, there's not enough ribosomes, they can't make enough precursor proteins so that some of those transporters are going out maybe empty. There's not enough, not enough material to load up all of your trucks. But then once the cells get big enough, they reach a point where there's so much material that every transport molecule, every transport complex that goes out to the tip is full of cargo, at which point making even more cargo isn't gonna help you because you're already saturated. So we think that this point of inflection where you go from having a dependence on diameter to losing that dependence may be telling us about this um, differential loading of these transporters. And that's getting quite exciting because there's now a whole series of competing models to ours, which say, so our, our, most of our models have been based on length depend, um, basically controlling the rate of transport in the flagellum. But Carl Lectrek, who's a, you know, a good friend of mine, but also we compete, so that's sort of a friend of me or something. Um, anyway, he has a different kind of model, which is that you're not regulating the, the transport per se, you're regulating the loading of substrate onto the transport. And I actually think a lot of that, maybe a lot of what he's seeing relates to this kind of effect that is when you're um, over a certain size range, you have a size dependence on the availability of substrate, but then beyond that, you, um, you, then you're saturated. So I think this is a way, this may be a way to test some of his ideas. Mm -hmm. 
So Wallace, I will ask you one more question and then for the remaining questions, we can take those that are here you know, at the end of both talks. So uh, this question is from Susan Daniel and she's asking, how does this change when the viscosity of the solution changes? Do they get shorter? Is there more noise, et cetera? Okay, so this is a question that I'm actually very happy to hear brought up in this group because I would love to get some advice from this particular group of, 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 of thinkers. The ways that we typically have tried to change um, viscosity, so you know, glycerol or you know, sucrose or something like that, or, or, or even um, methyl cellulose, also change the osmotic uh, strength of the media. And we know that um, the transport within the flagellum is strongly dependent on the osmotic conditions of the environment. So that if you add something like, say, sucrose to the media, what happens is that a little bit of fluid ends up um, you know, leaving the flagellar compartment and it completely locks down all the transport. So you end up having these huge, you know, effects. They're interesting, but they're, I think they're, they may be more driven by, by crowding rather than a sort of a sensing of the, of the viscosity. So if anyone has a good idea of a way to change viscosity in, a, in an isosmotic way, I will absolutely try that because I think that would be easy to, easy to find out. Because, yeah, because again, I guess it's a question of are the cells measuring length by measuring some resistance as they try to move through the media? I mean, that would be a really wonderful kind of model. Um, and I think you know some of our experiments with, with flow already may may encourage that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please give me advice. Feel free to you know either tell me later on in this or email me. I, I would I'd be internally grateful to have such an advice. Yeah, and we will have fifteen minutes after both talks. Plus, we will Wallace. We will send you all the questions, both you and Ajay, all the questions from the chat, so that you know you can continue the discussion with the questioners. Thanks, Wallace, again for a wonderful.